Rome in winter is saturated with foreigners. How one anticipates the months when most have departed, that the quiet observer might be able to concentrate his attention, the moment when the city of the soul ceases to be a monstrous watering place and curiosity shop forever ringing with American and German voices. Only at night, in the quiet of a waning moon, might one walk in peace. Observe Frederick Winterbourne, my creation, fellow countryman, fellow quiet observer. He passes the vaguely lit monuments of the Forum, approaches the great circle of the Colosseum in silence, the cavernous shadows of its structure, the clear and silent arena, ghostly in the pale moonshine. I have made of him a diffident, constrained young man who usually displaces matters of the heart by exercising caution, by learning poetry, and by being alone. But he is not, in fact, alone. Two persons are stationed on the low steps of the great cross. One, a woman, seated. The other, her male companion, standing in front of her. And they chatter freely, and they laugh. And our young friend stops, as if in horror. Or, it might be said, a sort of relief. For the young woman is Daisy Miller. And in this instant, he sees that if she is a young lady he need not respect, he may be released from his desire for her. And she, an innocent, a natural, an unsuspecting sacrificial lamb, poor Daisy Miller, how she might have loved him were he free to love. Now he turns away, steps back into the deep shade, back to where it all begins, this tale of mine, this study of innocence, of etiquette of what it is to be free. Let us start not in Rome, but in Switzerland, in Veve, on a clean June morning, clear light. Let us start with Frederick Winterborn. If I could only be this hotel, if I could sip its graceful ease with my coffee, slip it on like a waistcoat of fine silk, <laughs> how these laughing American girls might inhabit my manicured rooms. These German waiters, Polish boys, Russian princess, how very lovely they all are. How easily this hotel holds them in its elegant arms. I might simply be here at the trois Caron. I might forget to observe myself as I idly light a cigarette like this. Watch how I raise my chin as I draw a breath, exhale, thus. Who am I? The snow-crested Don du Midi, cool and blue? Hey, can I have a lump of sugar? Are you going to climb a mountain? This isn't a walking pool. It's an alpenstock. Indeed it is. It's a rather fine one. Can I have a lump of sugar? Uh, yes. I don't think sugar's good for little boys. You better just have one lump, hmm? Blazes! It's really hard! Take care you don't hurt your teeth. I haven't got any teeth to hurt. They've all come out. Look, I've only got seven. Mother counted them last night. And one came out right after. She said she'd slap me if any more came out. But I can't help it. It's this old Europe. It's the climate makes them come out. And I'm right they didn't come out. If you eat six lumps of sugar, your mother will certainly slap you. So she's got to give me candy. I can't get any candy here. American candy. American candy's the best. And are American boys the best boys? I'm an American boy. You're not an American. I am. You sure about that? Quite sure. Americans are the best. Oh, thank you. Oh, no. Here comes my sister. She's an American. American girls are the best girls. My sister ain't the best. She's always Randolph, blowing me. What are you doing with that pole? How pretty she is. How exceptionally striking. It's not a pole. It's an open stock. I'm going up the Alps. This way. <sighs> That's how they come down. I know. What, what to say to her? What on earth to say? He's an American man. Well, I guess you'd better be quiet. And be careful with that pole. It's not a pole. It's an open stock. Your brother and I have made acquaintance. Where'd you get that? Am I too forward? I bought it. Well, I hope you're not thinking of taking it to Italy. I am. I'm taking it to Italy. Oh, you're going to Italy. 
Yes, sir. Her gaze direct, unshrinking her clear blue eyes. Next stop, Italy. Are you uh, going over the Simplon? I don't know. I suppose it's some mountain. Randolph, what mountain are we going over? I am falling. Am I weightless? Losing the ground beneath my feet? Dear God, she's... Going where? To Italy. I don't know. I don't want to go. I want to go back to America. Beautiful. Italy. It's a uh, beautiful place. Can you get candy there? She smooths the ribbons at the front of her dress. <laughs> Does she see how she dizzies me? How she takes my breath? So long. Randolph. So you are traveling? <sighs> to Rome for the winter with my mother and my brother here. And he says you're American. I am. I wouldn't have thought so. You you seem more like a German, especially when you open your mouth. <laughs> I already <laughs> thought that. Hey, see how hmm. far I can be careful. Randolph! Well, I've met Germans who sound like Americans, but I've not as far as I recall ever met an American who sounded German. Oh, I'm talking rot. <laughs> Uh, would you be more comfortable sitting down? Too bold? Give me that bowl. You're a danger. Yes, come here, young man, and tell me your name. Randolph C. Miller, let me go. I shall not. Let me go and I'll tell you hers. You better wait till I'm asked. <laughs> I should very much like to know your name. Her name's Daisy Miller, but that ain't a real name. That ain't the name of our cards. It's a pity you haven't got one of my cards. Her real name's Annie P. Miller. Ask him his name, Randolph. And my father's name's Ezra B. Miller. My father ain't in Europe. He's in a better place than Europe. He's in Schenectady, upstate New York. I know where it is. I'm an American, remember. My name is Winterborn, Frederick Winterborn. You got a big business, my father. He's rich, you bet. Randolph, go and play. And be careful with that Alpenstock. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> he doesn't like Europe. So I've gathered. He wants to go back. To Schenectady? Yes, he wants to go right home. He hasn't got any friends here. There is one boy here, but he always goes around with a teacher. They won't let him play. And your brother hasn't a teacher? Mother thought of getting him one to travel around with us. There was an English lady we met in the cars. I think her name was Miss Featherstone. She wanted to know why I didn't give Randolph lessons. Give him instruction, she called it. I guess he could give me more instruction than I could give him. He's very smart. Yes, he seems smart. Mother's going to get a teacher for him as soon as we get to Italy. Can you get good teachers there? Oh, very good, I should think. Or else she's going to find some school. He ought to learn some more. He's going to college. That Miss Featherstone, the English lady in the cars, she asked me if we didn't all live in hotels in America. <laughs> I told her I'd never been in so many hotels in my life as since I came to Europe. I do think the hotels are perfectly good, though. Once you get used to their ways and Europe... Europe is sweet. Are they all like I'm this? The girls disappear. from New York, you know, so, so talkative, so free? Are you a simple girl, Daisy Miller? Miller? Do you observe you what so you're doing to me? I have so many friends, intimate friends, who've been to Europe ever so many times. And you know, I have so many dresses and things from Paris. Whenever I put on a Paris dress, I felt like I was in Europe. It was a kind of a, a wishing cap. The only thing I don't like is the society. There isn't any. Or if there is, I don't know where it keeps itself, do you? I'm very fond of society, and I've always had a great deal of it. I don't mean only in Schenectady, but in New York. Last winter, I had 17 dinners given me, and three of them were by gentlemen. I've always had a great deal of gentleman society. Of course, of course, she is turning every head in this garden. Why would she look a second time at me? Have you been to that old castle? Chateau de Chillon, yes, more than once. I imagine you've been there. No, I want to go dreadfully. We were going last week, but my mother gave out. She suffers dreadfully from dyspepsia. Mm. She said she couldn't go. Randolph wouldn't go either. He says he doesn't think much of old castles. But I guess we'll go this week if we can get Randolph. He isn't interested? He's only nine. He wants to stay at the hotel. Mother's afraid to leave him alone, and the courier won't stay with him, so we haven't been to many places. But it'll be too bad if we don't go up to the castle. Couldn't you get someone to stay with Randolph just for an afternoon? I wish you'd stay with him. I would much rather go to Xi'an with you. I am too audacious. With me? Uh, with your mother, too, of course. I guess my mother won't go after all. She don't like to ride around in the afternoon. But did you really mean what you said just now? That you'd like to go there? Most earnestly. Then let's arrange it. If mother will stay with Randolph, I guess Eugenio will, too. Eugenio? He's our courier. He's the most particular man I ever saw, but he's a splendid courier. I guess he'll stay at home with Randolph if mother does, and then we can go to the castle. You won't back out? I won't be happy until we go. Hey! Eugenio says lunch is ready. And you're staying in this hotel. And you really are an American? I am. 
I shall have the honor of presenting you to a person who will tell you all about me, my aunt. I'm starving hungry, and Eugenio says come now. All right, Randolph, I'm coming. Oh, well, maybe we'll go someday. I won't be happy until we do. Oh, yes, indeed. I have observed them, seen them, heard them, and kept out of their way. I'm afraid you don't approve. They are the sort of Americans that one does one's duty by not not accepting. Ah, you don't accept them. I can't, my dear Frederick. I would if I could, but I can't. The young girl is very pretty. Of course she's pretty, but she's very common. I see what you mean, of course. Do I? Do I see? Daisy Miller. Dear Anne, she is a charming girl. I don't doubt she's charmed you, Frederick. She has that charming look that they all have. I can't think where they pick it up. And she dresses in perfection, and yet no... No, you don't know how well she dresses. I can't think where they get their taste. <laughs> but my dear Anne, she's... She is a young lady who has an intimacy with her mama's courier. What? Oh, her mother's just as bad. They treat the courier like a familiar friend, like a gentleman. Well, I'm not a courier, and she was very charming to me. You had better have said at first that you'd made her acquaintance. We simply met in the garden, and we talked a little. Du bonnement, and pray, what did you say? I said I should take the liberty of introducing her to my admirable aunt. I am much obliged to you. It was to guarantee my respectability. And pray, who is to guarantee hers? <laughs> You're too cruel. She's a very nice girl. You don't say that as if you believed it. Mm, she appears to be uncultivated, perhaps uneducated, yes, but wonderfully open and very nice. And to prove that I believe it, I am going to take her to the Chateau de Chillon. You two are going off there together? Mm. I should say it proved just the contrary. How long had you known her, may I ask, when this interesting project was formed? You haven't been 24 hours in Veve. I had known her half an hour. Dear me, <laughs> what a dreadful girl. You won't meet her then. Is it literally true that she is going to the Chateau de Chillon with you, alone? Yes, I think she intends to. Then, my dear Frederick, I must decline the honor of her acquaintance. Is she too free? The exquisite Miss Miller. Is she too light? I have a dreadful headache. I'm going to lie down. Wait, 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 wait. wait. You, you really think... You really think that... Think what, sir? That she's the sort of young lady who expects a man sooner or later to carry her off? I haven't the least idea what such young ladies expect a man to do, Frederick. But I really think that you had better not meddle with little American girls that are uncultivated, as you call her. You have lived too long out of the country. You'll be sure to make some great mistake. You are too innocent. My dear aunt, I am not so innocent. You are too guilty, then. I swear, this has been the longest evening of my life. Have, have you been all alone? I've been walking around with my mother, but she gets tired. She's gone to bed? No, she doesn't like to go to bed. She doesn't sleep more than three hours. She says she doesn't know how she lives. She's ridiculously nervous. I guess she sleeps more than she thinks. She's gone somewhere after Randolph. She wants to try to get him to bed, but he doesn't like to go to bed either. <sighs> Let's hope she'll persuade him. She'll talk to him all she can, but he doesn't like her telling him. She's going to try to get Eugenio to talk to him, but Randolph isn't afraid of Eugenio. Eugenio's a wonderful courier, but he doesn't make much impression on my brother. I don't believe he'll go to bed before 11. I've been looking around for that lady you want to introduce me to. Your aunt. She's called Mrs. Costello. She is indeed. <laughs> how, how do you know her name? 
Oh, the chambermaid. She tells me everything. Your aunt's very quiet and very correct in her behavior. She wears white puffs, she speaks to no one, and she never dines in the hotel dining room. Oh, and every two days she has a headache. I think that's a wonderful description, headache and all, don't you? I want to know her ever so much. I don't know what to say. What can I say? I know just what your aunt would be, and I know I should like her. She'd be very exclusive. I like a lady to be exclusive. I'm dying to be exclusive myself. Well, we are exclusive, Mother and I. We don't speak to everyone, or they don't speak to us. I suppose it's about the same thing. Anyway, I shall be ever so glad to know your aunt. I'm sure she'd be most happy to, but I'm afraid those headaches will interfere. But I suppose she doesn't have a headache every day. Well, she... she tells me she does. She doesn't want to know me, does she? That's the truth. Why don't you say so? You needn't be afraid. I'm not afraid. How free you are to speak the truth. How dizzying. She, she knows no one. It's her wretched health. You needn't be afraid. Why should she want to know me? Gracious, she is exclusive. Yes, you are right. My aunt is a proud, rude woman. We needn't mind her. I shall speak it. I shall speak it loud. There's mother. I guess she hasn't got Randolph to go to bed. She's got my shawl on, too. She's always wearing my things. Mother! I'm afraid she doesn't see you. Or perhaps she feels guilty about your shawl. Oh, it's a fearful old thing. I told her she could wear it. She won't come here because she sees you. Ah, uh, then I better leave you. Oh, no, come on! It isn't for me. It's for you. I mean... It's for her. Well, I don't know who it's for, but she doesn't like to meet any of my gentleman friends. She's right down timid. She always makes a fuss if I introduce a gentleman, but I do introduce them, almost always. If I didn't introduce my gentleman friends to Mother, I, I shouldn't think I was natural. Mother? Oh, Mother! Oh, Daisy. This is Mr. Frederick Winterborn. What are you doing poking around here? Well, I don't know. I shouldn't you think he'd want that shawl. Well, I do. Did you get Randolph to bed? No, I couldn't persuade him. He wants to talk to the waiter. He likes to talk to that waiter. I was telling Mr. Winterborn. Yes, I have the pleasure of knowing your son. Hmm. Well, I don't know what to do with him. It isn't so bad as at Dover. And what happened to Dover? He wouldn't go to bed at all. I guess he sat up all night in the public parlor. He wasn't in bed at 12 o'clock, I know that. It was half past 12. Does he sleep during the day? I wish he would. It seems as if he can't. I think he's real tiresome. Oh, well, Daisy Miller, I shouldn't think you'd want to talk like that against your own brother. Well, he is tiresome, Mother. He's only nine. Well, he wouldn't go to that castle. I'm going there with Mr. Winterborn. Yes. Your daughter has kindly allowed me the honor of being her guide. Oh, look at the boats. Oh, Daisy, <laughs> but... Uh, Daisy! Oh, <laughs> She's never still. <laughs> well, the boats, they, uh... They do look most attractive in the moonlight. Oh, I've never been to that castle. We were thinking ever so much about going. But there's a lady here. I don't know her name. She says she shouldn't think we'd want to go to see castles here. She should think we'd want to wait until we got to Italy. There's so many there. Oh, of course, we only want to see the principal ones. We visited several in England. Uh, yes, in England there are beautiful castles, mm. but... Shion here is very well worth seeing. Well, if Daisy feels up to it, it seems as if there's nothing she wouldn't try. Oh, I think she'll enjoy it. You are sure you wouldn't like to join? Please say no. Well, I, I guess you two had better go alone. Mr. Winterborn! <laughs> hey, Mr. Winterborn! Mademoiselle! Come and see the boats! Don't you want to take me out in a boat? Uh, now? <laughs> of course! Oh, Annie Miller! Well, I beg you, madam, let her go. I shouldn't think she'd want to. I should think she'd rather go indoors. I'm sure Mr. Winterborn wants to take me. He's so awfully devoted. I will row you over to Xi'an in the start. <laughs> I don't believe it. Well, you haven't spoken to me for half an hour. Uh, that is quite untrue. I've been having a very pleasant but brief conversation with your mother. Well, I want you to take me out in a boat. Then if you will do me the honor to accept my arm, we will go and select one of them. I like a gentleman to be formal. Oh, I assure you, it's a formal offer. I was bound I would make you say something. You see, it's not very difficult. But I'm afraid you're teasing me. Oh, I think she's not, sir. Do then let me give you a row. <laughs> I love the way you say that. Well, I would love to do it. Yes, it would be lovely. I should think you'd better find out what time it is. It is 11 o'clock, madame. Oh, Eugenio, come out of the shadows. You're always hiding. I'm going out in a boat. 
At 11 o'clock, mademoiselle. What concern is it of yours? You are a courier. I'm going with Mr. Winterbourne. This is Mr. Winterbourne. He's an American, but you wouldn't think it. We're going in a boat, Eugenio. This very minute. Do tell her she can't. It's very late. I think you had better not go out in the boat, mademoiselle. My aunt is right. He doesn't know his place. I suppose you don't think it's proper. (laughs) Eugenio doesn't think anything's proper. (laughs) I am at your service. Does Mademoiselle propose to go alone? Oh, oh, no, no, with this gentleman. I meant alone with this gentleman. Oh, you're making such a fuss. I don't want to go now. I myself shall make a fuss if you don't go. (laughs) Perhaps that's all I want. A little fuss. (laughs) Mr. Randolph has gone to bed. Oh, oh, Daisy, Daisy, now we can go indoors and get some sleep. No. All right. Good night, Mr. Winterbourne. I hope you're disappointed or disgusted or something. I am despondent. I am puzzled. Well, I hope it won't keep you awake. Good night, then. And confused and disappointed, yes. Bereft. Don't you just love the steamboat? Isn't this better than traveling by carriage? Yes. What on earth are you so grave about? We're going to your castle. Am I grave? I had an idea I was grinning from ear to ear. You look as if you're taking me to a funeral. If that's a grin, your ears are very near together. I fear they are. (laughs) (laughs) They are not. I'm simply teasing you with your stiff face and your worried brow. Perhaps I should dance a hornpipe on the deck. Yes, please do, and I'll carry around your hat. It'll pay the expenses of our journey. What? Are you not willing to pay? No, 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 no. (laughs) No, I mean, no, I, I didn't mean, um, I... I am intoxicated. I am... Am I falling in love? Mr. Winterbourne? Miss Miller... I have never been better pleased in my life than at this moment. Really? Really. (laughs) I like to make you say those things. You're such a queer mixture. There are seven pillars of gothic mold in Xi'an's dungeons deep and old. There are seven columns, massy and gray, dim with a dull imprisoned ray. Uh, I forget the next line. Did you make that up? Uh, No. No, it's Byron. Lord Byron, the poet. Teach it to me. (laughs) All right. There are seven pillars of gothic mold. There are seven pillars of gothic mold. <laughs> in Xion's dungeons deep and old. <laughs> in Xion's dungeons deep and old. Wait. There are seven pillars of... What was it? Gothic mold. In Xion's... Dungeons. What is gothic mold? Go- it's gothic. Gothic is a style of architecture that was prevalent in Europe in the 12th to 16th centuries. <laughs> I've it's never m- met a man who knew so much as you. <laughs> so, there are seven... Pillars. I don't think I can learn a poem. Tell me something else. Oh. Um, well, the poem's called The Prisoner of Xi'an, and it was inspired by Francois Bonnevar, who was imprisoned here from 1530 to 1536. He was a Genevan that... Uh, well, you're yawning. Oh, I'm not. I'm gasping in amazement at your knowledge. <sighs> Though I'm not so sure I like these old castles. Oh, don't look so disapproving. Well, I, I've told you, I cannot help my face. <laughs> it's simply that they are so cold. It's cold in here. I don't like to be cold. And it's damp and heavy. And full of ghosts and specters. Don't say such things. Here, take my arm. Will you keep me safe? I will. <laughs> <laughs> say something, then. I'm afraid I'm not a great talker. Well, then, recite me some more of your poem. All right, if I can remember. Um, 
Lake Lehman lies by Xi'an's walls. This, a thousand feet in depth below, its massy waters meet and flow. Thus much the fathom line was sent from Xi'an's snow-white battlement, which round about the wave enthralls a double dungeon, wall and wave. Oh, waves. I so wish you would travel with us and go round with us. We might know something then. Don't you want to come and teach Randolph? Dare I? What if you... What if I... What if my aunt is right? What's wrong? Nothing. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to travel with you than to teach your brother, but I have, unfortunately, other occupations. What do you mean? You're so stuffy, you're not in business. No, but I have engagements, I... which mean that I must be going back to Geneva. Oh, no! I don't believe it, you... No, be careful, be careful! What an ugly hole! I might have fallen! Into my arms. It's called an oubliette, which means to forget. It goes down to the dungeons. Prisoners would have been thrown down there and forgotten. Oh, would they? Poor old prisoners. Poor old Bonnie. What's his name? Bonnie. You're being unkind to me. Well, Mr. Winterborne, I think you're being unkind to me. I think you're horrid. I don't say such things. I have half a mind to leave you here and go straight back to the hotel alone. I have engagements. You are horrid. It's a sad fact that I have to return to Geneva tomorrow. Does she never allow you away for more than three days at a time? Who? Doesn't she even give you a vacation in summer? Who? There is no one. I simply don't believe you. She waits for you in Geneva, watching the hours go by until you return, and if you don't return tomorrow, she'll come after you in a boat. Do wait over till Friday, and I'll go down to the landing to see her arrive. You're making fun. Stop. <sighs> Only if you promise me solemnly that you'll visit me in Rome this winter. That's not a difficult promise to make. My aunt has taken an apartment in Rome for the winter, and she's already asked me to come and see her. I don't want you to come for your aunt. I want you to come for me. Why am I so afraid, so very afraid? All right, I will. I promise. I will come for you. Please close that window, Frederick. I'm observing the Roman citizens, dear aunt, strolling the piazza. Can't you feel the breath of spring in the air? I can smell an unpleasant smell, which is in all likelihood carrying the Roman fever. And as you well know, I can't abide a draft. All right, as you will, dear aunt. I need to speak to you. I am all ears. Those Miller people you were so devoted to last summer at Veve have turned up here in Rome, courier and all. Daisy Miller, your name shoots an arrow through me. Well, after what happened at Veve, I certainly think I will call on them. They seem to have made several acquaintances, and the young lady is very intimate with some third-rate Italians with whom she rackets about in a way that makes much talk. I gave them my word. If you desire to keep up the acquaintance, Frederick, you are very welcome. Of course, a man may know everyone, Men are welcome to the privilege. What is it that so offends you? The girl goes about alone with foreigners. As to what happens farther, you must apply elsewhere for information. She has picked up half a dozen of the regular Roman fortune hunters, and she takes them about to people's houses. When she comes to a party, she brings with her a gentleman with a good deal of manner and a very large mustache. No. I have dreamt of you leaning from an old Roman window, not unlike this window, asking yourself when Frederick might arrive, as he promised. And I haven't the least idea where her mother is in all of this. Of course, I know little about them, only that they are very dreadful people. They are simply uncultivated. Miss Miller is very innocent only. Depend upon it, they're not that bad. Miss Miller is a flirt, and the entire family is hopelessly vulgar. Whether or not being hopelessly vulgar is being bad is a question for the metaphysicians. They are bad enough to dislike, at any rate. 
And for this short life, that is quite enough. Might she be right? Am I making a wretched fool of myself? Am I enchanted out of my senses? Well? Will you accompany me to Mrs. Walker's tea tomorrow? I doubt it, Frederick. Will you go? I think so. I'm surprised you want to visit Mrs. Walker. You two used to be such firm friends until her husband died. I understood you must have had a disagreement. No, no, I I merely... Other engagements or... Our lives took separate paths. And well, it... I only hope you don't run into those ghastly people there. So, how is Geneva, Frederick? Oh, unchanged, I would say. Your boys still in school there? They are. I couldn't live there myself these days. I prefer staying here. I love the culture of Rome, the history, and the city has such energy, such fire. It's a real pleasure to see you. And you as ever. I sound so gauche, so... no, so insincere. How could I ever You seem distracted. No, I... I'm... Excuse me. I must welcome my guests. Of course. Yes, you have come. I turn my back to the door. Why am I afraid? I won't be long. I take a breath. A deeper one. I unfurl my brow for you. I lift my cup. I sip my tea. I breathe again. I know you. Oh, Randolph. I'm sure you know a great many things. How's your education coming along? Is that candy in that bowl? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Well, I declare, it's Mr. Winterborn. Miss Miller, I told you I should come. Well, I didn't believe it. Oh, well, I have. But I thought you might have come to see me. Here I am. Before. Well, I only arrived yesterday. Ah, uh, Mrs. Miller, hello. Please defend me, Mrs. Miller. I don't believe that. Your beautiful, unflinching eyes. I am lost. Randolph, what are you eating? I don't know. It don't taste good. Uh, you are acquainted with Mrs. Walker? We've got a bigger place than this. It's all gold on the wall. I told you, Mother, if you were to bring him, he would say something. <laughs> I told you, and I tell you, sir, it is bigger, too. I hope you've all been well since we parted at Veve. Oh, no, no, not very well. Oh. She's got the dyspepsia. I've got it, too. Father's got it. I've got it worse. Oh, that they would all fade away, that we could be alone. I, I suffer from the liver. I've heard this so many times before. I'm going to find Mrs. Walker. Wh Me too. I'm hungry. Oh, Daisy! Daisy, take him! Oh. <sighs> I think my liver doesn't like this climate. It's less bracing than Schenectady, especially in the winter season. I don't know whether you know we reside at Schenectady. Uh, I was saying to Daisy that I certainly hadn't found anyone like Dr. Davis, and I didn't believe I should. Oh, at Schenectady, he stands first. They think everything of him. He has so much to do, and yet there was nothing he wouldn't do. How for lightly you crossed the he room. He never saw anything like Did you glance back at me? But he was bound to cure it. I'm sure there was nothing he wouldn't try. He was just going to try something new when we came off. Mr. Miller wanted Daisy to see Europe for herself, but I wrote to Mr. Miller that it seems I couldn't get on without Dr. Davis. And there is a great deal of sickness here, too. It affects my sleep. I'm sorry to hear that, Mrs. Miller. And tell me, how are you in general finding Rome? Rome? Oh, a disappointment, I must say. We'd heard so much about it. I suppose we'd heard too much, but we couldn't help that. We're finding it unpleasantly crowded and very fast. I don't know, but even in late winter, there's a fever in the air. We've been led to expect something different. I hate tea. Uh, wait a little, Mrs. Miller, and you will become very fond of Rome. I hate it worse and worse every day. You are like the infant Hannibal. I am not. <laughs> no, you're not much like an infant. But we've seen places I should put a long way before Rome. There's Zurich. I think Zurich's lovely, and we hadn't heard half so much about it. Where have you gone? You've grown tired of me. The best place we've seen is the city of Richmond. He means the ship. We crossed on the ship. <laughs> Randolph had a good time on the city of Richmond. <laughs> it's the best place we've seen. Only it was turned the wrong way. Well, we've got to turn the right way sometime. I hope that at least your daughter has found some happiness in Rome. Oh, Daisy's quite carried away. 
It's on account of the society. She goes around everywhere. She's made a great number of acquaintances. I must say they've been very sociable. They've taken her right in, and then she knows a great many gentlemen. I counted 17. Randolph, be quiet. Am I merely number 18? Oh, Daisy thinks there's nothing like Rome. Of course, it's a great deal pleasanter for a young lady if she knows plenty of gentlemen. I've been telling Mrs. Walker how mean you were. <laughs> mean? I would prefer you didn't sully my good name with Mrs. Walker. She says you're old friends. Are you old friends, Mr. Winterbourne? And what is the evidence you've conjured for my meanness? Why, you were awfully mean at Bevy. You wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't stay there when I asked you to. Are you coquettish? Are you teasing me? My dear Miss Miller, have I come all the way to Rome to encounter your reproaches? <laughs> Just hear him say that. Encounter your reproaches. Did you ever hear anything so quaint? So quaint, my dear. What's quaint? Uh, Mr. Winterbourne. Mrs. Walker, I want to ask you something. Mother, I tell you, we've got to go. Eugenio will kick up a storm. I'm not afraid of Eugenio. Now, Mrs. Walker, you know I'm coming to your party. I'm delighted to hear it. I've got a lovely dress. I'm sure you have. But I want to ask a favor. Permission to bring a friend. I shall be happy to see any of your friends. No, they're not my friends. It's an intimate friend of mine. Really? Really? Why do you glance at me before you speak your blue eyes? I never spoke to her friends. Mr. Giovanelli. How charming. Before you speak... He's an Italian. He's a great friend of mine. He's the handsomest man in the world. Except for Mr. Winterbourne, of course. He knows plenty of other Italians, but he wants to know some Americans. I look forward to meeting him. You catch my eye. Well, I guess we'll go back to the hotel. He thinks ever so much of Americans. He's tremendously clever. Oh, he's perfectly lovely. Why do you catch my eye? It's been a pleasure to see you, Mrs. Miller. You may go back, Mother, but I'm going to take a walk. She's going to walk with Mr. Gio Vanelli. I am going to the Pincio. Alone? At this hour? I don't think it's safe. Is it safe? Is it vulgar? N neither do I. You'll get the Roman fever, sure as you live. Remember what Dr. Davis told you. Give her some medicine before she goes. <sighs> Mrs. Walker, you are too perfect. <laughs> I'm not going alone. I'm going to meet a friend. Mr. Giovanelli, Giovanelli, Giovanelli. Randolph, your friend won't keep you from getting the fever. Is it, Mr. Giovanelli? It is. The beautiful Giovanelli. You go too far. My dear young friend, please don't walk off to the Pincio at this hour to meet a beautiful Italian. Well, he does speak excellent English. <sighs> Gracious me, I don't want to do anything improper. There's an easy way to settle this. The Pincio is only a hundred yards from here, and if... Mr. Winterbourne were as polite as he pretends, he would offer to walk with me. Of course, Miss Miller. It will be my pleasure. Why haven't you been to see me? You can't get out of that. As I've told you, I've only just stepped off the train. Then you must have stayed in the train a good while after it stopped. Were you asleep? I... I you had time to go see Mrs. Walker. I knew Mrs. Walker. I know where you knew her. You knew her at Geneva. She told me so. And I wonder how well you knew her, your older friend. But you knew me at Vevey, and that's just as good. So you ought to have come. Well, I've come now. Hmm. You look a little feverish. <laughs> and stiff as ever. It's merely the crowds. <sighs> I love the crowds. I love the society here. There's all kinds. English and Germans and Italians. I think I like the English best. I like their style of conversation, but there are some lovely Americans. I never saw anything so hospitable. There's something or other every day. There's not much dancing, but I must say I never thought dancing was everything. I was always fond of conversation. I guess I shall have plenty at Mrs. Walker's. Her rooms are so small. I cannot breathe. I cannot... And your hotel, Miss Miller, is it... Oh, we've got splendid rooms at the hotel. Eugenio says they're the best rooms in Rome. We're going to stay right into spring, if we don't die of the fever. And I guess we'll stay then. It's a great deal nicer than I thought. I thought it would be fearfully quiet and pokey. I was sure we would be going around all the time with one of those dreadful old men that explain about the pictures and things. But we only had about a week of that, and now I'm enjoying myself. I know ever so many people, and they're all so charming. I wonder where Mr. Giovanelli will be. Must you meet him? We had better go straight to that place in front of where you look at the view. I will not help you find him. <laughs> then I shall find him without you. I'm not leaving you. 
Why? Tell me why. I... I... Are you afraid you'll get lost or run over? <laughs> of course not, no, I... There he is, see him? Leaning against that old tree. Mr. Giovanelli! Look at him. He doesn't hear me. He's staring at the women in the carriages. Did you ever see anything so cool? Do you really mean to speak to that man? That little man who is rather handsome, with his artfully poised hat, nosegay in his buttonhole? Mr. Giovanelli! Not a gentleman, but perhaps a clever imitation. Do I mean to speak to him? Why, you don't think I mean to communicate with him by signs. Please understand, then, that I most certainly intend to stay with you. I don't like the way you say that. It's too imperious. I beg your pardon if I say it wrong. The main point is to give you an idea of, of my meaning. Listen to yourself. I've never allowed a gentleman to dictate to me or to interfere with anything I do. Well, you should sometimes listen to a gentleman. The right one. <laughs> I do nothing but listen to gentlemen. So, you can tell me if Mr. Giovanelli's the right one. No, he's not. He's not. Mr. Giovanelli! You have made a mistake, Miss Miller. He is not the right one. Signore Winterborn, I am very pleased to meet you, sir. Mr. Giovanelli? Miss <laughs> Miller, pray, what are you doing? I, I'm trying to take my arm. Choose where you want to walk, Miss Miller. Beside? Before? Behind? Let me walk between you. This is quite... Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> is quite unbearable. Come along, Mr. Winterborn. Take my other arm. There. <laughs> I have chosen life, life, and more life. You are life, Miss Miller. <laughs> Captured in the moment of a beautiful young lady. Now come this way. Uh, come, Signore Winterborn, also. There is delightful music playing. And I have chosen... What have I chosen? We could dance! Oh, but look. Wretched soul crouched over his begging bowl. There are sorry beggars in every city, Miss Miller. Don't look. But should we give him... No, no, please, let's... We shall walk to the Terrazzo del Pincio. You can see the whole of the glorious city before you, and the sun will go down so beautiful. You have seen this, Signore Winterborn? I, yes, I arrived just a few days ago, but I have visited Rome before. Mr. Winterborn? Mr. Winterborn? Why, I... I must speak with you. I... Excuse me one moment, Miss Miller. The music is so beautiful. <laughs> this is really too dreadful, Frederick. That girl must not do this sort of thing. She can't walk here with you two men. Fifty people have already noticed her. I think it's a pity to make a fuss about it. It's a pity to let the girl ruin herself. She's very innocent. She's very crazy. Did you ever see anything so imbecile as her mother? After you'd all left me, I couldn't sit still for thinking of it. It seemed too pitiful not even to attempt to save her. I ordered the carriage and came here as quickly as possible. Thank heaven I found you. What do you propose to do with me? My concern is not with you. I propose to ask Miss Miller to get in this carriage and to drive her about here for half an hour so that the world may see she's not completely running wild and then to take her safely home. I don't think that's a very good idea. Mrs. Walker, what are you doing here? Come and join us. We're having such a splendid promenade. Oh, I adore your carriage rug. And I'm delighted to have the chance to introduce you to Mr. Giovanelli. Good evening, madame. I'm glad you admire my rug. Will you get in, Miss Miller, and let me put it over you? Oh, no, thank you. I shall admire it much more as I see you driving around with it. Do get in and drive with me. That would be charming, but I'm having an enchanting evening just as I am. Aren't I, Mr. Giovanelli and Mr. Winterborn? It may be enchanting, dear child, but it is not the custom here. <laughs> well, then it ought to be. If I didn't walk, I should expire. You should walk with your mother, dear. With my mother, dear? If you were my mother, maybe, but my mother never walked ten steps in her life. And you know, I'm not still five years old. No. You're old enough to be more reasonable. You're old enough, dear Miss Miller, to be talked about. What do you mean? Come into my carriage and I'll tell you. I don't think I want to know what you mean. I don't think I should like it. 
Should you prefer being thought a very reckless girl? Uh, what? Does Mr. Winterborne think that to save my reputation, I ought to get into the carriage? Mr. Winterborne? I think you should get into the carriage, Miss Miller. <laughs> I never heard anything so stiff. If this is improper, Mrs. Walker, then I am all improper and you must give me up. And perhaps you too, Mr. Winterborne. Well, goodbye. I hope you'll both have a lovely ride. Miss Miller! Excuse me, Madam Walker. A good evening for you. Where are you going, Frederick? I feel bound to accompany them. If you don't get in here, I will never speak to you again. All right. All right, I will. Just... Please just wait a moment. Miss Miller! I'm, I'm so sorry. Mrs. Walker has made an imperious claim on my society. Then good evening to you, sir. I... I You'd I, better run along then, hadn't you, Mr. Winterborne? Farewell. Your Miss Miller has been doing everything that is not done here. Flirting with any man she can pick up, sitting in corners with mysterious Italians, receiving visitors at 11 o'clock at night. Dancing all evening with the same partners. You sound like my dear old aunt. Well, maybe your dear old aunt is right. I thought you more open-minded. It was not clever of you to reprimand her like that nor to demand that she step inside this carriage. If she's so perfectly determined to compromise herself, the sooner you know it, the better. You said this was not about me. Nor is it. I'm really trying to protect her. She does not know how to behave abroad. <laughs> I suspect you judge her conduct improper wherever you encountered her. And I suspect you meant no harm. So I thought a month ago. But she's been going too far. I'm told that at their hotel, everyone is talking about her. And that a smile goes around amongst the servants when a gentleman comes and asks for Miss Miller. <laughs> the servants be hanged. The poor girl's only fault is that she's uncultivated. She's naturally indelicate. Take that example this morning. How long had you known her at Vevey? A couple days. Fancy that. Her making it a personal matter that you should have left the place. I suspect that you've lived too long in Geneva. Why did you insist I get into your carriage? To beg you to end your relations with Miss Miller. Not to flirt with her, to give her no farther opportunity to expose herself. In short, to let her alone. No, I'm afraid I can't do that. I like her far too much. I don't want to see you caught in a scandal. <laughs> There's nothing scandalous in my attentions to her. There certainly will be in the way she takes them. But I've said what I had on my conscience. If you intend to rejoin the young lady, I'll put you down. There she is, with her cavalier, perching on the wall. I do wish to rejoin her. I'm sorry, but I do. I should not have left her. Stop here, will you please? Good night. Am I a fool, Daisy Miller? Am I destined to only ever observe you as I observe myself? Vista of the city laid out behind you, yet it seems you are intent only on him. He takes your parasol and opens it. He rests it on your shoulder. He... You laugh. But I can't see your face. Oh, you laugh so easily. You are so light. You're standing now. Too close to him. Close behind the parasol. I, I can't... Oh, I can't... My collar is sticking to my neck. My right shoe pinches my heel. Miller. Oh, Mrs. Walker, I'm so pleased to see you. I don't know anyone here. Oh, I'm so frightened. You know all these people? It's the first time I've ever been to a party alone, especially in this country. Now, I wanted to bring Randolph or, or Eugenio or someone, but Daisy just told me that... Oh, Mr. Winterborne. Good evening, Mrs. Miller. Daisy, she just pushed me off by myself. Now, I ain't used to going around alone. And does your daughter not intend to favor us with her society? Oh, well, Daisy's all dressed. She got dressed on purpose before dinner. But she's got a friend of hers there, that gentleman, the Italian. Um, Mr. Giovanelli. Hmm, that she wanted to bring. They've got going at the piano. It seems as if they couldn't leave off. Mr. Giovanelli sings splendidly. <sighs> 
But I guess they'll come before very long. I'm sorry she's coming. In that way. Well, I told her there was no use in her getting dressed before dinner if she was going to wait three hours. I didn't see the use of her putting on such a dress as that to sit around with Mr. Giovanelli. But, oh, here she comes. Oh, Daisy, Daisy. Resplendent, glowing. Every head turns. She's trying to take revenge on me for remonstrating with her. Well, I shan't speak to her. You're too harsh. Mrs. Walker. I'm afraid you thought I never was coming, so I sent Mother off to tell you. I wanted to make Mr. Giovanelli practice some things before he came. You know, he sings beautifully, and I want you to ask him to sing. You met Mr. Giovanelli the other evening. Good evening. I am sorry, dear. You know, I, I introduced him to you. He's got the most lovely voice, and he knows the most charming set of songs. I made him go over them this evening on purpose. <laughs> we had the greatest time at the hotel. Is there anyone I know, apart, of course, from Mr. Winterbourne, Good evening, Mr. Winterbourne. I think everyone knows you. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Miller. Signore Giovanelli. Who asked him to sing? I most certainly did not, I assure you. Excuse me, I have other guests to attend to. Oh, you're there, Mr. Winterbourne. You're always hiding. Isn't it a pity these rooms are so small? We can't dance. I am not sorry we can't dance. I don't dance. <laughs> of course you don't dance. You're far too stiff for dancing. I hope you enjoyed your drive with Mrs. Walker. No, I didn't enjoy it. I prefer walking with you. Yes, damn it, be bold. I ache for you. We paired off. That was much better. But did you ever hear anything so cool as Mrs. Walker's wanting me to get into her carriage and drop poor Mr. Giovanelli? And under the pretext that it was proper... People have different ideas. It would have been most unkind. He had been talking about that walk for ten days. Are you taunting me? Do you recognize your impropriety? Am I? He should not have talked about it at all. He would never have proposed to a young lady of this country to walk about the streets with him. About the streets? Where then would he have proposed to her to walk? The Pincio is not the streets either, and I, thank goodness, am not a young lady of this country. The young ladies of this country have a dreadfully pokey time of it, so far as I can see. I don't know why I should change my habits for them. <laughs> Such inexhaustible good humor. Do you not see how misdirected it is? Your innocence, your beauty, your undefended. I'm afraid your habits are those of a flirt. Of course they are. I'm a fearful, frightful flirt. Did you ever hear of a nice girl who was not? But I suppose you will tell me now that I'm not a nice girl. You're a very nice girl, but I wish you would flirt with me and me only. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. You are the last man I should think of flirting with. As I've had the pleasure of informing you, you are too stiff. You say that often. <laughs> if I could have the sweet hope of making you angry, I would say it again. Don't do that. When I'm angry, I'm stiffer than ever. Really? But if you won't flirt with me, do at least stop flirting with your friend at the piano. They don't understand that sort of thing here. I thought they understood nothing else. Not in young unmarried women. It seems to me much more proper in young unmarried women than in old married ones. I don't wish to know to what or whom you refer. I refer to nothing. I... I am simply informing you that when you deal with natives, you must go by the custom of the place. Flirting is a purely American custom. It doesn't exist here. So... When you show yourself in public with Mr. Giovanelli and without your mother... It, Gracious, poor mother. Though you may be flirting, Mr. Giovanelli is not. He means something else. He isn't preaching at any rate. And if you want very much to know, we are neither of us flirting. We are two good friends for that. We are very intimate friends. No. Ah. So be it. If you are in love with each other, it's another matter altogether. I have offended her. She blushes. Mr. Giovanelli, at least, never says such very disagreeable and unpleasant things to me. Miss Miller. Bravo, Mr. Giovanelli. Not so magnificent. A little out of tune, I fear. Won't you come into the other room and have some tea? I most certainly will. It has never occurred to Mr. Winterbourne to offer me tea. I have offered you advice. I prefer weak tea. Mrs. Walker. She's turned her back on her. You turned your back on her? I should have turned my back on her when she arrived. You look to your chattering mother, look to the circle of guests at the door. How pale you've turned. How grave, how shocked, how puzzled you are. Would I go to you, or would I 
That was very cool. She never enters my drawing room again. Oh, Mr. Winterborn, you must be looking for Daisy. Dear, dear, you look as tired as me. And I'm so worried about this Roman fever. I've said to Daisy and to Randolph, you must be sure to keep your hands clean. She's gone off with Mr. Giovanelli. She's always with him. I've noticed they are very intimate. Oh, it seems as though they couldn't live without each other. Well, he's a real gentleman anyhow. I keep telling Daisy she's engaged. And what does Daisy say? She says she's not engaged, but she might as well be. She goes on as if she was. I've made Mr. Giovanelli promise to tell me if she doesn't. I should want to write to Mr. Miller about it, shouldn't you? You were preoccupied by her intrigue with that little barber's block. Do you call that intrigue? An affair that goes on with such peculiar publicity? Uh, come this way, I'd like to see the Pieta, and then I'd like to leave. I've heard a dozen people speak of them. They say she's quite carried away by him. And you must have noticed, she is never invited to people's houses these days. So many acquaintances of mine have intimated their desire to express to observant Europeans that Miss Daisy Miller's behavior is not representative of America. Here's your pieta, Frederick. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Carrara marble. I believe so. You know, this was the only piece he ever signed. It was made for the Cardinal's funeral monument. I don't think Giovanelli expects to marry her. And who is Giovanelli? Ham, the polished little Italian. Yes, but what is he? Oh, he's apparently perfectly respectable. A minor lawyer. He doesn't move in the first circles. And how do you know this? I've asked questions about him. He's evidently immensely charmed with Miss Miller. He's never found himself in personal contact with such splendor, such expensiveness as this young lady's. And she must seem to him wonderfully pretty and good-humored and interesting. But marrying her would appear to him too impossible a piece of luck. He has nothing but his handsome face to offer. And, and, remember, there's a substantial Mr. Miller in that mysterious land of dollars. Giovanelli knows he hasn't a title to offer. But, my dear boy, she has gone too far. You may well be right. Can we leave now? You must surely be tired. Mr. Winterborn. Miss Miller, Mr. Giovanelli. You're always going round by yourself. You must be very lonesome. I am quite contented. Can't you get anyone to walk with you? It is such a beautiful day for walking. You know this, Palatine Hill, Mr. Winterborn. Beautiful ruins, Mr. Very... Giovanelli, I should like it most awfully if you would pick a sprig of that blossom over there. I should like to wear it. In my hair, perhaps. How am I still enchanted? Why can I barely breathe? Certainly. I shall go now. Uh, over there. This one. That's it. I know what's wrong with you. You think I go around too much with him. Everyone thinks so, if you care to know. Of course I care to know. But I don't believe it. They're only pretending to be shocked. They don't really care a straw what I do. I think you'll find they do care. Haven't you noticed anything? I've noticed you. But I noticed you were as stiff as an umbrella the first time I saw you. And you're even stiffer now. You'll find I'm not so stiff as several others. How shall I find it? By going to see the others. What will they do to me? They'll give you the cold shoulder. Do you know what that means? As Mrs. Walker did the other night. Exactly. You want more? Miss Miller? One more. It's so beautiful. Your compatriots, they want to assure observant Europeans that, that your behavior is not... I shouldn't think not... you'd let people be so unkind. <laughs> How can I help it? I should think you'd say something. I do say something. I say that your mother believes you're engaged. Well, she does. You're perspiring, Mr. Winterborn. Are you unwell? I am perfectly well. Oh, here comes Giovanelli, garlanded Since with you have mentioned gloss. it, I am engaged. You don't believe it? Yes, I do. One for the golden locks of your hair. You will walk with us? No. No, thank you. You don't. You don't believe it. But if you ever do, well then, I am not. I stood within the Colosseum's wall midst the chief relics of almighty Rome 
the trees which grew along the broken arches waved dark in blue midnight and the stars shone through the rents of ruin. <laughs> it's her with Giovanelli at midnight, a spectacle for our times. <sighs> how smartly she plays an injured innocence, how glad I am to be free of her. She is a young lady a gentleman need no longer be at pains to respect. It's Mr. Winterborn. He sees me and he cuts me. I do not cut you, Miss Miller. How long have you been here? All evening. I never saw anything so pretty as this Colosseum. I'm afraid you won't think Roman fever very pretty. This is exactly the way people catch malaria. I wonder that you, a native Roman, should count on in such a terrible indiscretion. Oh, for myself, I am not afraid. Neither am I for you. I'm speaking for this young lady. I told the signorina it was a grave indiscretion. But when was the signorina ever prudent? I don't look like much, but I'm healthy. I've never been sick, and I don't mean to be now. That's a ridiculous thing. I was bound thing. to see the Colosseum by moonlight. I shouldn't have wanted to go home without that. And we've had the most beautiful time, haven't we, Mr. Giovanelli? We have. If there's been any danger, Eugenio can give me some pills. He has a whole box of them. Then I should advise you drive home as quickly as possible and take one. Take three. What you say is very wise. I will go now for a moment to make sure the carriage is at hand. Well, I've seen the Colosseum by moonlight. That's one good thing. Why don't you say something? Did you believe I was engaged the other day? It doesn't matter what I believed the other day. Well, what do you believe now? I believe it makes very little difference to me whether you're engaged or not. Quick, quick! If you get in by midnight, you are quite safe. Like Cinderella. Don't forget to take the pills. I don't care whether I have the Roman fever or not. And by morning, they will all know that the little American flirt was out all alone at midnight with her Italian. Perhaps I hardly care. She's always going around at night. I shouldn't think she'd want to. It's so play dark. You can't see anything here at night. Except when there's a moon. In America, there's always a moon. It's going around at night that's made her sick. And where's your mother? She's with my sister. You want to go in? No, 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 no. Um, please, though, Randolph, do give my regards to your sister. Mr. Winterborn, I just stepped out to get a breath of fresh air. You know, this worry, it's very bad for my dyspepsia. It's fortunate that Dr. Davis gave me plenty of medicine to bring with me to Rome, but oh, how I wish he was here. He would know exactly what to do for Daisy. Half the time, I barely understand what they're saying to me and Daisy. I don't know how what is to Miss do. Miller? She's not well. She's really not well. Oh, she spoke of you the other day. Half the time she doesn't know what she's saying, but that time I think she did. She gave me a message. She told me to tell you, uh, oh, it's so fortunate that I've run uh, into Her you. message? Oh, her message was, she told me to tell you she never was engaged to Mr. Giovanelli. She said it over twice or three times. Tell Mr. Winterborn I never was engaged. I'm sure I'm very glad to know it. That Mr. Giovanelli, he hasn't been near us since she's been taken ill. I thought he was so much of a gentleman, but I don't call that very polite. Anyway, Daisy says she's not engaged. I don't know why she wanted you to know, but she said to me three times, mind you, tell Mr. Winterborn. Oh, 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 and then she told me to ask if you remembered the time you went to that castle in Switzerland. Uh, she talked to me about that time before. She always remembered that day. Oh, just yesterday, though, she said to ask you, but I said I wouldn't give any such message as that, only if she's not engaged, I'm... I'm sure I'm glad to know it. I observe myself standing alone in a little Roman cemetery, stiff collar, tight shoes, beneath the cypresses, among the wild spring flowers, the raw earth. Am I in this moment? Are you here? Oh, Mr. Winterborn. Mrs. Miller, I am my deepest sympathy. Such a glorious day. And so many mourners, even this far from home. 
My dear Daisy was always the most popular. She so wanted you to know how she remembered that day at the castle. Your daughter was the most beautiful young lady I ever saw. I am so sorry for your loss. Thank you, Signor Giovanelli. Excuse me. If you will, I must, um... I can't, uh... Eugenio is going to take me. Of course, of course. The most beautiful and the most amiable. And she was the most innocent. The most innocent? Yes. The most innocent. Why the devil did you take her to that fatal place? She had no fear. She always did what she wanted to do. That was no reason. If she had lived, I should have got nothing. She would never have married me. You know this. You are only giving it a second thought because you're back here at Veve, where the whole story episode began. I should never have invited you. It's a beautiful day. Take yourself out on a boat, why don't you? Visit the castle. No, don't visit the castle. Really, Frederick... She's on my conscience. I fear I did her an injustice. I'm sure I don't know what you mean by that. How? She sent me a message before her death, which I didn't understand at the time. But I've understood it since. What message? She would have appreciated one's esteem. Is that a modest way of saying that she would have returned your affection? I think yes. Perhaps. But she was... Please, Aunt, no. You were right in that remark you made last summer. I was booked to make a mistake. I've lived too long in foreign parts. Winterborn sits on alone in the hotel garden. He watches the little steamer crossing the water, approaching the picturesque towers of the Chateau de Chillon. There had been such a lovely breeze on the waters that day a year ago, and Daisy Miller had been in such charming spirits. She had avoided neither his eyes nor those of anyone else. She had blushed neither when she looked at him nor when she saw that people were looking at her, as they always must, for she was so very beautiful. She, for her part, had believed her sentiment for Winterborne to be entirely unreciprocated, conscious as she was only of his imperious attitude, his stepping away at the moment she most wished him to stay near. He lights a cigarette, inhaling sharply, to be certain the smoke will burn his throat. He'll not go back to Rome this winter. Soon he'll return to Geneva and it will seem duller and larger than he remembers it. He'll decide to settle there and to study hard.